Hey everyone, welcome to Table Talk 2. Here we are, after our first Table Talk, Constructive Conversations. We thought it would be really helpful to have a next step towards wading into the sticky things of faith. And this is that next step. Today we're talking about seeing together. Some tenets of Constructive Conversations. The mystery of God is at the center of our faith. The global church needs to be in dialogue. Speaking with clarity is important. We must hold together the whole Bible. We believe that God is active now. With all this in mind, let's go. Last Table Talk, we talked about a Trinitarian model of conversation. Our goal is unity, not uniformity. And difference is not division. We are trying to hold together a space where we can participate in each other's viewpoints and where we can facilitate really rich and theologically reflective dialogue that we believe will model the character and, and the identity of God as three in one. Table Talk One was a necessary stepping stone toward building a space where we could have conversations about topics that really entangle, where there's a lot more heat than light in some of these topics. We wanna create a space where we can discuss one another's viewpoints, where we can seek scripture together, where we can create a space of conversation and dialogue that we believe the American church in particular desperately needs. So from that table talk, we have a whole list of things. If you guys remember this big piece of paper of hot button issues. Looking at that, it became apparent for us that we need one more stepping stone before we really wade into to those. What we're going to talk about today is a topic called epistemology. Okay, what is that? It's simply how you know what you know. It's the framework that allows us to build the conclusion. That's all we're looking at is how we got to where we got. We're gonna show our work. What is our process? One metaphor we can use, which we'll return to for understanding epistemology is the idea of lenses. So what we wanna do today is become aware of the lenses that shape us. You see, we all bring into the conversation different perspectives, different angles. We are shaped by different things in our life that color or shift our perspective. Sometimes those things can bring additional clarity and sometimes our lenses distort the truth. Now, the list I'm about to list of lenses, things and th that shape you and that cause you to see things from a certain perspective, we're just trying to become conscious of them. This list is not meant to disparage anybody or make anybody ashamed of their starting place. It's just reality. Because we're coming from different places sometimes, we don't always see the same thing together. We're trying to become conscious interpreters. Maybe we could call it a lens check. Here's some lenses, personal disposition economic status, educational level, ethnic group, cultural identity, belief system. All of these things play a role in our epistemology in how we know what we know. They can provide additional clarity and additional coloration of the things in our lives, the way we see what the truth is and the way we interact with scripture. Here's where we find a really helpful framework for epistemology from a gentleman you may know called John Wesley. John Wesley had this idea that scripture, reason, tradition, and experience were all important in shaping our viewpoints. People have called it Wesley's quadrilateral. Hey Wesley, th thank you bud for that, it's really helpful. Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience are in a dialogue. They are not mutually exclusive. They need each other to help us understand reality. We as Bible-believing Christians need scripture to dialogue with these very human parts of our lives in order for us to understand and appreciate the reality that the scriptures paint, the reality that God is trying to communicate to us. If you don't mind, we're going to adjust Wesley's template just a little bit in the interest of our conversation. Today, we're going to look at three of these things. Uh, 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 uh. 
So from the outset, I just wanna argue that each of these are important. You can't dismiss any of these. We need these lenses to shed light on the truth. We're also gonna present today that scripture is the key arbiter of dissonance and the holder of interpretive tension when these things aren't quite seeing things the same. It's our primary lens of how we know what we know. So are you ready to look at tradition, experience, and scripture together? So let's imagine these things as friends at a table. They need table manners, don't they? Just like we do. We're going to introduce each one and kind of show where they're behaving healthily and where they tend to uh, gobble up one another. Let's introduce our first partner to the table, Tradition. <laughs> tradition has been called the living faith of the dead, quoting a, a lecturer by the name of Jaroslav Pelikan. I think I'm saying that right. What is your relationship with tradition? What is your relationship with tradition? What is your relationship with tradition? Does that word glow with the gilded pages and, uh, and, and make you feel as cozy as a, a broken in leather chair? Tradition? Or does tradition, that word make you shudder a little bit and get nervous and uh, maybe feel a little cramped? like a tight space. Many of us Protestants have a love-hate relationship with tradition. It's kind of built into our name, right? Protestant protesting tradition. It's kind of in our origin story. Maybe I need to finish Professor Pelican's quote. Just as tradition is the living faith of the dead, traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. As we will also do with experience, we will attempt to hold tradition in a healthy place making it neither a demon nor an idol. Don't demonize it, don't idolize it. So I wanna go ahead and define tradition in the healthy sense. And then we'll also define traditionalism when tradition becomes toxic. So like we said, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Part of the heritage we get as Christians is that we have a historical faith. There have been people that have believed in Jesus and followed them in their cultural context and have passed on something that we should treasure. It's something living and dynamic. These table talks are a new tradition alive in our church that really echoes an old tradition of, of rich theological reflection and conversation within the life of the early church. Living faithfulness of the church to the faith. It's, it's helpful direction and wisdom that we inherit from our different traditions. And of course, we do need to be suspect of it. Like uh, Professor Pelican said, <laughs> Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Ecclesiastical fossilization. L let's not let our tradition become just dead things. It's wooden adherence to formulations of the past. So keep in mind the distinction between these two things. Tradition, alive, living faith of the dead. Traditionalism, dead faith of the living. Not really knowing why or what we're doing and doing it anyway. So when it comes to our epistemology, here's what we need to keep in mind. We need the voices of the past to help us. It would be arrogant and prideful for us to assume that we in our own generation have all the resources we need to know everything about God, when in fact we get to treasure the insights and the tr the the customs and the approaches and the thoughts and the questions of those who came before us. One of the amazing things about the Christian faith is that it is this inter-era connection all the way back. Look at the genealogical tables in, in the scriptures. It is important that we acknowledge how the generations have shaped us and we believe that every generation is important. Now, every generation is made up of fallen humans. We don't want to let tradition gobble up every partner in our epistemology. We don't want to let tradition become the dominant member of conversation and gobble up scripture and silence experience altogether. That's traditionalism. When we keep tradition in its treasured place, in its valued place, in its wise advisory of the generation's place, Tradition can be incredibly helpful in creating and giving us insight into the present and our faith with God today. I find this quote from Beth Felker Jones incredibly helpful 
in helping us keep tradition as a treasured member of this conversation without making an idol out of it. We simply cannot tell the story of theology, nor can we practice discipleship faithfully, without accounting for the wide varieties of ways that God has used Christians throughout history to spread the gospel to the world. So, while I stand as a part of tradition of evangelicalism, and while I think this tradition has much to offer the wider Christian tradition, I also believe in the need for conversation between Christians from across centuries and backgrounds whose lives have been shaped by the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ. These conversations can be difficult and challenging. New perspectives can expose our assumptions and reveal areas where we have wrongly identified contextual elements of our time and place as essential to the gospel. In engaging with others, we are held accountable for mistakes we might make because of our limited perspectives. And as we gain insights about God that we would be unable to see on our own, as we talk with one another, we are forced to do the hard work of articulating what we believe and why we believe it. This hard work becomes a gift to us because through it we are strengthened to be the people God has called us to be and to fulfill the task God has set out for us in our own time and place. As we live in this way, we stand at a long line of Christians who together make up the great cloud of witnesses called by God to put doctrine into practice as we share the good news of salvation. So guys, I hope that's a beautiful summary of how to dialogue with tradition and our understanding of what is really real, our epistemology, how we know what we know. And as we dialogue with scripture and as we dialogue with cultural issues and we dialogue with experience, tradition can play a helpful shaping role at the table. Don't demonize tradition at the table and don't idolize it either. So guys, we see this tension in tradition in scripture. It's there. We see this positive element. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. That's Paul to Timothy and 2 Timothy. He's talking about passing down Christian teaching and tradition. This is a positive affirmation of a healthy role of tradition in shaping the present. And we see Jesus give warning to the Pharisees against the toxic traditionalism we've been exploring. He says, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. This is the inappropriate use of tradition, what we would call traditionalism, when tradition manhandles the scriptures. So we're shooting for tradition, not for traditionalism. We should treasure tradition, not traditionalism. Tradition is a council of voices to consult for orientation, for wisdom, and perspective. And we need to treat them with as much respect as we attempt to treat each other. And with that in mind, we also need to keep them from becoming idols, from becoming gods at our table. Tradition is no god. Let me uh, add a cautionary word from missiologist Timothy Tennant. Especially here in the West, we need to keep from thinking our traditions are the only traditions that matter. But there is a fine line between confidence and arrogance. Indeed, most Western theologians now recognize that it would be arrogant to believe that one or more of the theologies of our culture has produced, have somehow managed to raise and systematically answer all questions for all Christians for all time. Every culture and every age has blind spots and biases that we are often oblivious to, but which are evident to those outside of our culture and time. Our historical brothers and sisters are as fallen as we are. And some of the louder voices in our tradition have been toxic. A segue to our next member of the interpretive triangle experience. I wanna play a clip from an interview with the late Richard Twiss, a Native American theologian who rightfully demonstrates the power of toxic tradition, developed in part by an unhealthy dialogue between tradition and experience in scripture. Misapplication of scripture can be enshrined in tradition. This is just an example of the kind of toxic tradition that can can be installed in a group of believers across generations. We call this one manifest destiny. So here we are 400 years, 500 years into the, the American experiment. And even with guys like William Penn, the great Pennsylvania experiment of coming to America, European peoples, to build a nation, as it were, built on certain biblical ideologies, 
and a sense of chosenness, a sense of uh, God sending them, God leading them, fleeing Europe, persecution, etc. Coming here to establish the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And, and coming with that sense of chosenness from the narrative of, of, of what they experienced, sort of that Exodus narrative, escaping persecution, escaping Egypt as it were, coming to the promised land and finding us, the native people, who in that metaphor became their Canaanites. So we stood in the way of them occupying the land of milk and honey. And so here we have 400 years now of uh, colonialism and uh, colonization. But the unique American brand of uh, colonialism had embedded with it a biblical narrative of chosenness and sovereignty uh, so that the, the theology of American expansionism is, is manifest destiny. So in that, in that sort of myth, the myth of, of manifest destiny, it made us as native people an obstacle to be overcome in order for them to build the kingdom of heaven here in America. So if you read all those early speeches of, of the quote-unquote founding fathers, uh, there's continual ongoing references to God, the Bible, chosenness. And so here we are now, a couple centuries into that, and today the host people of the land, uh, we have the highest incidence of unemployment and poverty. Uh, we have the highest incidence of teen suicide in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we have the highest incidence of diabetes, tuberculosis per prison, uh, uh, highest prison population per capita and uh, lowest uh, life expectancies, and yet we live as tiny islands in the most prosperous, uh, military, powerful nation in the history of the world. How do we safeguard against something like this? We know this characterizes a large period of American Christianity, and, and this kind of interpretive tradition carries on today, and it justified the genocide of the native peoples. That's not good mission work. That's the possible fruit of a fallen, toxic tradition, a traditionalism that discolors scripture and discolors experience rather than adding clarity. So we need another partner besides tradition to help keep tradition in check. We need experience. So when cultural blind spots occur like this and they get enshrined in tradition, what is our way forward? We can talk, dialogue with the experience of another group. We can rely on the lived experience of Christians in the global church from other cultures, from other ethnic groups, from other regions, from other economic locations. Experience can blind us to other sources of truth that I'm only going to trust what, what I can observe or my group observes. So just like there's some tension within tradition where tradition can become an idol and can, tradition can be a, a healthy, wise friend, the same is true of experience. Experience can be a, a blessing and experience well, it can really damage us. To go with a personal example, think about someone who has experienced an abusive father figure and how they might approach the texts and scripture and the tradition that preserves the image of God as father. That experience is going to make it difficult for them to, to interface and to trust the tradition and the picture from scripture. We need to be aware that experience uh, sometimes is at our own hands, that we choose to experience certain things, and, and sometimes experience is, is a trauma that occurs to us. So I'm speaking here of individuals, but the same can happen of groups, and that's really what I want to focus in on this presentation, the experience of a group. Voices outside of American Christianity are really helpful at pointing out the collective plank in the eye of individualistic American view of experience. Theologians like Sung Chan Ra, I really love his work, talk about this cultural captivity. One of the ways he sees is an antidote to that cultural captivity of Western tradition, uh, I'm speaking to us here, is to, to dialogue with Christians who who have a different realm of experience, either an ethnic group or socioeconomic class or a country. I want to do that right now and dialogue a little bit with Renee Padilla, 
who uh, represents so much of, of Latin American Christianity, who, who passed away just last year. So let's read his really rich work. He talks about something called culture Christianity as it pertains to the West. And it's the kind of Christianity I'm talking about that's really kind of unhealthily merged and, and enfolded in a tradition of American exceptionalism. So his argument here is taking place about mission and ethics. So let's take a look at how he sees this dialogue between tradition and being expanded by the experience of other Christian cultures. Those of us who live in the majority world cannot and should not be satisfied with the rote repetition of doctrinal formulas or the indiscriminate application of canned methods of evangelization from the West. I'm not advocating here for a relativistic approach to theology. I am calling for a recognition of a problem and a change of attitude. The change of attitude being called for involves the renunciation of ethnocentrism and the promotion of a theological cross-fertilization among different cultures. Padilla has a point, and it's part of a larger argument. I hope it's coming across here even from this excerpt. Let's put it this way. It, it, let's survey your bookshelf. Do you guys want a, a tour of my bookshelf? I'm running out of space for books because the children take up a lot of room. There's some books there. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Here, look at those books. Here's some more books. Love me some books. Uh, you gotta have a lot when you're going through seminary. It's a big expense. Now imagine if every one of those books behind me were written by one particular demographic in one particular socioeconomic location with one particular ethnic group and one particular job description. Let's say, I don't know, 40-year-old white megachurch pastors in suburban America? Hmm. 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 Do you think they might have, collectively, a bit of an experiential limitation? That they might have some cultural blinders or some things that they haven't experienced that they cannot speak from experiential authority with that might limit my exposure to other cultures? You see, that's the kind of stuff Padilla is talking about. It's one of the reasons one of our Table Talk tenets is a dialogue with the global church, because we believe the experience of global Christianity is absolutely important in shaping us, we American Christians here in the Southeast. So I'm inviting you in part to the journey I've found myself in where I'm trying to diversify my reading portfolio. I want to be shaped by the Korean immigrant church like Sung Chan Ra is helping me do. I want to be shaped by the Native American theologians that I've been so richly blessed by. And I want to be shaped by the global south. And Rene Padilla is helping us do that even now. Now, what I'm saying has made some people really nervous uh, over the last few years, I've noticed in particular, that the idea of experience giving us knowledge, some people have compared that to an early church heresy called Gnosticism, and it's not a one-for-one -one comparison. It's not really fair. I'm going to let Dr. Eric Mason address that in just a moment. This is a gross oversimplification, but here we go. The Gnostics believed that the body was bad and the soul was good. They believed in a secret knowledge that God would reveal that would release them from their imprisoned selves. And so this secret knowledge was salvific. And if you knew this secret knowledge, you would be saved. But it was an early church heresy that, that you see people arguing with. And actually they appealed to tradition to kind of bat it down. So what I'm not talking about here is the idea that this epistemology, this experience is somehow um, that the experience of a particular ethnic group or socioeconomic class is somehow salvific. I believe people of every class, creed, nation, tongue have access to the grace of God. And so I don't believe that there is a particular way to experience God only through a particular ethnic group. So that's not what I'm talking about. And some people flatten the argument of some of the theologians I've referenced to, to say that, and that's just not what they're saying. What they are saying is that the experience of other ethnic groups, of the intercultural, inter-era, inter-tribe, interlinguistic church of God, this family of believers, that we actually can help each other with our cultural blind spots, with our interpretive blind spots, with the planks in our eyes. We need each other. What the dialogue with 
a wide variety of experiences within the Christian tradition, what it does is it safeguards us from the echo chambers that are algorithmically stronger than they've ever been and pre-sort us to predisposed ways of viewing the world. So the idea of, of diversifying our dialogue and, and increasing our experience portfolio so that we're learning from other people it's for mutual edification. That's what Padilla is talking about. Cross fertilization. Are we learning from brothers and sisters that look different than us, that speak different languages than us, that live in different locations than us, that occupy a different social economic class than us? That, I believe, will yield amazing fruits. Let me just play Dr. Eric Mason's take on this, which I find quite funny and very helpful in destigmatizing the role of experience in our epistemology. It's not Gnosticism. It's just learning from one another. Here we go. What do I look like acting like I can understand everybody's experience? Like, what do I look like telling my wife I understand pregnancy? The heck is going on here? I would look crazy saying, baby, I know exactly what that, what that, when you had that contract, oh, I felt that right there. I, man, my wife in the strength of the Hulk will choke me to, to within an inch of my life at that moment i can't i can't i, I can't tell certain people that had cancer all through their body i understand exactly what it means to have cancer i can't I, I, a gender people of different genders can't say i understand what it's like to be your gender if i'm not that gender you can try to empathize with another gender but that doesn't mean you are of that gender <clears throat> nobody knows what it's like to be president until you're president so for someone to talk about ethnic Gnosticism, you got to call everything Gnosticism. You got to call it female Gnosticism, male Gnosticism, pregnancy Gnosticism. I mean, you'd have to apply it to so many different things because you, 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 you would have to apply that principle to everything. But the terms use trigger words that try to make a concept that was heretical connected to an to opposing person's view. I love what Dr. Mason has to say. And we need to keep that in mind. It's okay to learn from each other's experience. It's a part of how we know what we know. So let's stay in dialogue. Of course, it's in dialogue with scripture. We check scripture with our experience. We cross-reference it. It interprets experience. Of course, we, we have tradition to help us and kind of give us some parameters for what experiences that we're looking for. And we need the intercultural, international dialogue of experience as we come into scripture, as we come into, into tradition and reassess these things. Uh, because we believe that God can make himself known in the church, right? Table Talk Tenet, God is active and alive in the church. We believe that's true today. What is experience? Experience is the active and embodied individual and collective observations of reality. Their experience of individuals, there are experiences of cultural groups. All of these make up the tapestry of experience that we believe is part of how we know what we know is lived experience. Experience has to be a part of our epistemology. It has to be a part of how we know what we know. We can't say that we learn nothing from our ex human experience that shed lights on God. So with that being said, this affirmation of experience and its role in shaping us, especially at the corporate level, the collective level, we also need to be aware at the collective and individual level of a danger we might call experientialism. We, we can go too far in our reliance on experience. When experience becomes the key guiding voice, the arbiter of all things, we become a little bit, I don't know, individually self-absorbed, but culturally prideful. And we can think there's only one way to experience this, and it's, and it's my experience. And then it starts to, to kind of manhandle scripture, and it starts to kind of reinterpret and enshrine unhealthy tradition. When experience goes toxic, we can call it experientialism, when you assume that experience is the source of all knowledge. We need to be aware of the role of experience. Where is it situated at our council, our triangle of voices? Has experience been driving the conversation too much and we haven't consulted scripture in a while and we haven't really looked at tradition? We need to be aware of experience because we can make it a really healthy and needed voice and partner in unlocking some of our understanding of God. So where is experience at your table? Just like we saw this tension in the scriptures with tradition, we see the same thing with experience. In the Jerusalem Council's letter to the global church, 
we see it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They are discerning from their own experience what God is saying is true. And we also see a negative role of experience. And, and it really hangs over all of the biblical canon, but we can we can point particularly to Paul's narrative of this of sin's corruption of human faculties, although they claimed to be wise they became fools. We know that we're fallible and can be misled by experience that warps the truth in our broken world and it warps our view of the holy God. Let's treasure experience, not experientialism. We all know that we've had experiences that have told us lies about ourselves, about each other, and about God. So we need to become aware of experience, that it can be this incredibly helpful dimension of our faith and it can also mislead us it's the same tension we have in tradition and experience they both need to be kept in place they need to have some table manners and they have to be dignified at this table they need to be invited to this table as well so while there are risks to either one of these things they need a place at the table and the place where they meet is a place that we call Scripture. In some ways, the Scriptures are where tradition and experience come together. It's where the experience of God became tradition of ancient Israel. It's where these things met and found their fullness. Christians have long held to Scripture as the key interpreter of tradition and experience, the key lens, the key component, the bedrock of epistemology. The Word of God does not come to destroy tradition, but direct it. It does not come to dismiss experience, but to discern it. We believe in the distinctiveness of Scripture as an interpretive lens, as an epistemological filter, as the bedrock of our faith, of the view into the realist reality there is. And we do so by affirming the attributes of Scripture. I'm going to follow the work of Timothy Ward here, whose work on the doctrine of Scripture I found incredibly helpful. So we affirm the necessity, the sufficiency, the clarity, and the authority of Scripture. Why? Because we believe it is from God. We believe it's needed because without it, we don't have this record of God's encounter with human experience that was preserved in tradition, that, that Christ reveals himself through it. We believe in its sufficiency, that it gives us enough of you, a God, that no, even though we see in part, it's through a glass darkly, as Paul says, that we do see and, and that God has given us some clarity about about himself, assurance in our faith from the scriptures. We believe in the clarity of scripture that no, not every verse is absolutely clear. And yes, there are some parts of scripture that seem to dialogue in some different directions as one another. But we believe God has communicated clearly enough that we get the big picture of what he is about, of who he is, of his salvific intent to us is, that we understand and can proclaim with confidence what the gospel is because the Bible is clear about the good news of Jesus. And ultimately, this all spills over, as Timothy Ward describes, from the authority, from who wrote it, who is the author of scripture. The authority is from who authored it. And he did so incarnationally, in a sense, because he partners with humanity to do so. But we believe these are the words from God, inspired, written, transmitted, copied, passed down, that ultimately what we have preserved here is a speech act from the one who created us. And so it's out of his authority that we can hold these things as primary ways to see the world. These attributes of scripture make us cling to it as the primary lens. So we've got all these lenses, right, of way to see the world, and we need to make sure that we locate the one that gives us the most clarity, the most certainty, the one that we need the most, the one that comes directly from, from God. We need scripture as our primary lens, but we don't ditch these, do we? No, because the scriptures are where these other lenses meet. It's where these other things find meaning and purpose, direction, discernment, because we believe God used tradition to reveal himself, and we believe God can be experienced in the here and now. So why would we rob ourselves of these dialogue partners and let scripture silence 
tradition altogether and silent experience altogether. God wants us to have a full faith and he wants us to experience him and he wants our traditions to reflect the formation that he wants for God's people. And so let's use all of these things appropriately in tension with scripture. That's why we open our Bibles. That's why we study God's word. That's why we look at original cultural context and attempt to understand and discern the communicative acts of God because we believe God is communicating truth. So we hope all of these table talks and really all of our ministries reflect that kind of rigorous study of God's word because we believe it gives us a picture of not only who God is, but of who we are and of what reality is like. Let me use three metaphors to try to synthesize all of this stuff. We can think about maps, we can think about lenses, and we can think about a fellowship. So maps, right? Maps give you a lay of the land, a look at the terrain. They give you an idea of what's out there, but not every map can convey everything. So you might have a topo map, you might have a street map, you might have a, a, a map that's to a hidden treasure chest or whatever, and they all kind of communicate different levels. And so one of the things we want to do, if we think of scripture and tradition and experience as different maps, we don't throw them out. They're, they're describing different things. We think of these things as maps that collaborate with one another then we can understand that the best way to do is to layer our approach. Yes, we have the authoritative base map that we're, not, we're gonna make sure we check the contours of when we approach things, the scriptures. But experience is supposed to give us a lay of the land of helping to see the things the scriptures are talking about. Tradition is supposed to help us understand or like an experienced tour guide, maybe where these key points are and how to proceed with them. They're maps, don't throw them out, use them together. Maybe this cartography metaphor doesn't help. Maybe vision is is more helpful metaphor. That's the one we've titled this after, seeing together. But lenses, right? You've already seen the illustration. Uh, if you're looking at something with a microscope, you're looking at something with sunglasses, you're looking at something with reading glasses. They all have a different point to them. And we believe that these things, if we view scripture and tradition and experience as complementary lenses, that what we're looking at is God, we can look at God through these things. And if they, they're dialoguing and talking to one another, and yes, again, we believe that scripture is the primary lens, then we can interpret what we're looking at with the confidence that though we see in part, as Paul says, that we do see we do see something of God. And yes, there's that eschatological tension that we're not going to have utter and complete clarity on everything until kingdom come, but we do have enough of an understanding of what's really important that we can proceed in faith. And then a final metaphor, uh, we've been talking about table manners. What if we envisioned these as dialogue partners, a fellowship, a team that if, if you personified each one of, what would tradition look like if it was a person? What would experience look like if it was a person? And they started talking to one another. Scripture might be the, the wise leader, but he's not going to tell experience to shut up, is he? Is experience gonna say, hey tradition, get out of here. I don't want you anymore. They're friends, guys, they're friends and they talk to each other. And so experience, she needs tradition and tradition, he needs experience and they all love and trust scripture. If you think of it that way, don't be threatened by the traditions you bring to the table. Don't demonize them, don't idolize them. That would be bad table manners. The same applies with experience. You, you have to let your experience open up to the traditions and the scriptures. They're a fellowship, they're a team. They work together, they talk together, they accomplish things, they adventure together, and they trust one another. So maybe these are helpful metaphors to help you see this triangle as a little more dynamic and interpersonal than say, like a four-legged stool is what I've heard it compared to before with the Wesley's quadrilateral. A stool is just a piece of furniture. Let's go a little more dynamic in our, in our mental picture. And so the last thing I want to do is I want to give you a parable uh, to, to, to give you a sense of the importance of the need for dialogue in epistemology for how we know what we know. And this ultimately points to our table talk, that this is a dialogue that we need to talk 
together. You guys may be familiar with this ancient parable of the blind men and the elephant. And the parable goes something like this. There are a bunch of blind men who are feeling around at this object and, and they, in the dark, they cannot see what they're looking at. They grab different parts of the elephant to understand what's there. The first grabs the trunk, who believes he has found a snake. The second grabs a leg and believes, based on the texture and the size, that he's holding on to a tree. A third finds himself holding the ear of the elephant, believing that he has a tent. The fourth grabs the tail, who assumes he's holding on to a rope of some sort. The fifth grabs the tusk and assumes he has perhaps a spear, some sort of weapon. All of these parts are true, aren't they? There's a guy named Paul Hybert, a uh, really helpful voice when it comes to epistemology. There's naive realism and there's subjectivism. There's critical realism. The naive realist would say something like this. Let's go with the guy who's holding the, the trunk. I've got a snake. And he hears his brother back at the tail saying, I, I don't think it's a snake. This might be a rope. And he hears the brother at the leg saying, nah, man, this is a tree. And he says, you guys are all wrong because I'm holding a snake. That's naive realism. When you assume you have the whole picture and you have something, you believe in truth, but you need the rest of the people to talk. Let's go down to subjectivism. In this case, the brothers would say something like this. I've got a snake. I've got a tree. I've got a tent flap. I've got a spear. And then they decide together that there is nothing really there. That in their subjective view, there's nothing there. I'm just holding on to disconnected parts that they're not actually related to one another. And so there probably isn't a real truth because there's no way we can make sense of all of this together. So that's kind of defeatist. And the first one's kind of narcissistic. The one in the middle requires humility. The one in the middle believes there's absolute truth, that there is something true, that there is things to be known with some level of certainty, but that we need dialogue to find that out. The critical realist says, okay, okay, I'm holding this thing that feels like a snake and you're holding that thing that feels like a, a tree trunk. Is there anything that this could be together? Maybe we're going to have to talk to each other. Maybe we're going to have to move around to, to move through each other's viewpoints so that we can together figure out what is really real. I believe that the Christian faith is like that. And I believe that the dialogue partners of scripture and tradition and experience are like that, that they actually describe something real. Yes, we're fallen. And yes, we can sometimes say with all of our pride, like the naive realist, that we've got the whole picture. And we can say uh, sometimes like the subjectivist, just kind of give up and, and be completely fine with relativity, that these things are disconnected, that we can't piece together the, the truth. But the critical realist will stay committed to dialogue because they believe truth is real and that it could be collectively discerned. And that's what I believe we as brothers and sisters in Christ across the generations, across the continents are committed to the pursuit of the reality of God and how he wants to shape us in our real lives, in our, in our experience, in our tradition through scripture into what he is setting out to accomplish. And we can have a real view of him. We can hold on to, let's stay committed to critical realism. Let's stay committed to an epistemology a framework of how we know what we know that rigorously, rigorously is committed to discussion. And as we pick up our experience and as we assess our tradition, may we meet God in his word and see truth together.